Well, hello and welcome to Pod of the Gaps, the podcast that talks about different cultural and interesting issues from a theological, apologetic and uh, sometimes humorous point of view, um, when Andy Bannister's feeling humorous anyway. Um, and this is with myself, Michael Otz, Andy Bannister and... Well, actually, not Aaron Edwards today. Where's Aaron gone, Andy? I know it's, it feels very strange, Michael, to be recording an episode of Pod of the Gaps with without without Aaron. But he is apparently he's on he's well he's on holiday. Not apparently he is on holiday, but he's gone to some part of the country where there apparently there is there is no Wi Fi, there is there is no 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 internet. So he he has gone off. He's gone completely off completely incommunicado. He has disappeared. He's not even getting text messages. So he, doesn't incommun- incommun- know, he doesn't even know that we're recording. I mean, to be yeah. fair. There are parts of the country where technology is slower. I'm on I'm on holiday in 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 Somerset, Michael. And down and down here, there are still parts of Somerset where if you say to people, you know, ask people about the internet, that's assumed that it's something to do with fishing, you know, <laughs> or you know, I used to be into I used to be into hunting and shooting, and, and now I'm internet and uh, and stuff. So um, and, apologies. And the Wi-Fi who, is who, the Wi-Fi is who they're married to, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh that's very good yes so exactly so we can't assume that everything is a is a sprawling metropolis like uh the parts of the country that you know you and i normally reside in but so yeah it's just you and i aaron aaron has vanished aaron so we can say anything we like yes yes we could um we were we're no theologians just... to correct us yes yeah so we, we could say we could also discuss all the issues that we might disagree with aaron on this would be quite good so we can get our words in before he can respond but uh uh, but we'll leave that for when Aaron's back because I think that. Well, we also fun. had. A, I also like the idea we came up with before we pressed the record button that we we take a series of sort of you know appropriate affirmative noises from from Aaron and we just you know insert those into the recording. So 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 listeners at home, you will think that Aaron's here. We, we can take little snippets of him going, "Yes, Michael," and "Absolutely, Andy," and then we can spend the next half hour saying outrageous things and having Aaron, Aaron <laughs> nodding nodding along. It'd be like the the electronic version, the uh, the I Aaron. Uh, the theologian who always agrees. Um, so get us right. So, so you're on holiday, and Aaron's on holiday. Do, do you get more commitment points then because you're recording this podcast? While I I'm might holiday. do, yeah. And you're and you're about to go on holiday, aren't you? I believe you're off to Scotland, yeah. to North East. Were you? Yeah, I can't pronounce it right. Outer Hebrides. I, I don't know whether they've ever heard of. In fact, it's a funny story about Wi-Fi. Um, a couple of years ago, when we went uh, to this uh, holiday cottage, um, uh, they asked if it had Wi-Fi, and the people said, "Oh yes, yes, it's got it's got a Wi-Fi." And they got there, and they were looking for the Wi-Fi router, and uh, they couldn't find it. And uh, they said, didn't you say it had Wi-Fi? They said, no, 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 it has Hi-Fi. And there was a a double cassette Hi-Fi system (laughs) in the house. So um, technology has moved at a different pace in the Outer Hebrides, apparently. Absolutely. Um, But talking about holidays, because we always like to have some kind of tenuous link from what we've just talked about. Tenuous link, absolutely. So tenuous link coming up. in. To say that in the week that we are recording this episode, um, the Foreign Secretary has been in big trouble for being on holiday um, because uh, as we've been uh, in the week that we've been recording this, uh, basically uh, massively in the news has been the situation in Afghanistan as the uh, Western powers have pulled out, uh, the Taliban have come in, taken control again of the country. Uh, we've seen horrific images of people seeking to flee the country, absolute chaos at Kabul airport as people are literally clinging to the underside of planes, taking off, trying to get out of the country. Um, and as all of this is unfolding, um, as a result of the actions uh, in the West of, of our leaders, um, Dominic Raab was on holiday and, and was, I think, probably rightly criticised for um, being on holiday while all of this was, was, was kind of unveiling. But I guess it brings up a question, which is, this isn't the first time um, the West has got involved in countries which are predominantly Islamic. Let's say it. Let's let's, let's name uh, the issue here. Um, and and actually, it seems that as a result, we don't seem to understand um, the Islamic world, uh, Islam as a system, um, and and we feel that we can kind of go in, get involved, and we get confused that things don't work out in the way that we would expect them to work out if we were a kind of Western country. So we really wanted to think today about about how we respond um, to to Islam as a as a system, uh, how the West um, maybe misunderstands it. Um, Andy, you've had a bit of experience engaging with Islam. So although Aaron is not here, um, it's great that you are here. Um, talk us a little bit about your backgrounds um, hmm. engaging with Islam as a system. Yeah. So um, before we dive into to some of the sort of politics and questions ar- around that, Michael. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, so my background is that my my PhD, my doctorate, is actually in Islamic studies. 
uh, not biblical studies. I, I, I ticked the wrong box on the university application form, and it was three months before I realized <laughs> I was reading Arabic and not the, no, that, that, that joke rarely works. Um, no, so my background is that in the late 1990s, I had begun getting involved in dialogues and debates with, uh, with Muslims on the streets of London, particularly at a place called Speaker's Corner, which is part of one of our big parks in, in London where on a, you can stand on a ladder or a box and talk about anything. Muslims are using it to preach Islam. And I'd fallen in with a bunch of Christians who decided, hey, there's lots of Muslims at Speaker's Corner. Let's go and stand on our ladders and our soapboxes and engage with them. And I found those conversations with the Muslims I met there absolutely fascinating because here was a group of people who believed, passionately believed, um, uh, in their religion, very, very different to what I, I believed, and they were not afraid of telling me that they, they disagreed with me. And it was through debating and dialoguing with them that I really discovered apologetics. You know, that's the, the, the branch of Christian theology concerned with giving a reason why we believe what we believe. But also, I just became really drawn to um, just the, the challenge and the need for the church and for Christians to engage with, with Islam. So when I came to, to then do, you know, higher academic work, I thought, well, you know, I could spend five years studying, you know, John the Gospel writer's use of the semicolon in the Greek text of John chapter one, or something boring like that, which should actually be fairly fruitless because there is no punctuation in, in Greek. Um, or I could do something really interesting and different. And so I dived into <laughs> the origins of Islam and looked at the Quran and how it's put together and then did some critical work on the Quran. And that brought me into lots of engagement uh, with Muslims. And so even today, I would say probably 30% of my time is around Islamic issues, engaging with with Islam and with Muslims, writing on it, um, training and equipping Christians how to engage uh, with Islam, mentoring young Christian scholars to do critical work on on Islam and so on. So yeah, been an area of, of passion for a while, and then on the political side, which we'll, we'll come to in a sec, I guess you know I've, I have looked bemused throughout that kind of twenty year period of how Western politicians just seem to make mistake after mistake after mistake when engaging the Muslim world. Mm. Yeah, um, I think it's interesting you talk about Speaker's Corner because another thing that's happened just in the last few weeks in the news, um, although you could have quite easily missed it because the BBC did their best to try and not report it, um, it would seem, uh, is that Hatun Tash, um, a Christian preacher, um, a convert from Islam, um, uh, was engaging at Speaker's Corner and, and uh, talking uh, with Muslims, and was stabbed um, uh, and thankfully... Um, survived um, it could have been far far worse um, but it was very interesting uh, in telling how the BBC reported it or, or rather how they didn't report it so no mention that the attackers were Muslim uh, no real mention of, of what was going on um, or the details or the motivation and, and so on and and it kind of seems like in our culture we're just kind of scared to talk about Islam would you would you say that's the case um, that we yeah we mm. we kind of fear of even talking about it or saying that there might be a problem here I think you're absolutely right. And I think, you know, we started talking about, about Afghanistan. Um, and then, uh, you know, you look on the geopolitical scene, you could mention, you know, Afghanistan, Iraq, Iran, um, Saudi Arabia, you know, which is this quite toxic presence, I think, in the in the Middle East. But, you know, Western companies are quite happy to, you know, do business with Saudi without sort of <laughs> asking questions about women's rights mm -hmm. or human rights. Um, that, re that, 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 that trend goes right the way through you know, you get then sort of, you know, Western progressives uh, who love nothing more than perhaps laying into into Israel and what they see as its behavior, but never sort of really grapple with the fact that if you were progressive, particularly LGBT, there's only one country in the Middle East where you'd wish to reside, and that would be Israel, because all the mm -hmm. Muslim countries that surround it are hardly bastions of, uh, of human rights and tolerance. And then that thread runs right the way through here to the West, mm -hmm where we've had everything from on the continent. You've we obviously had uh, Charlie Hebdo, you know, the, 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 the satirical magazine whose offices were attacked and, and, uh, and writers killed by extremists, various Islamic terror attacks, Manchester, most notably here more recently in the UK. Then right the way down to, as you say, Hatun Tash, who was attacked at Speaker's Corner. And of course, yeah, not merely did the BBC not report the fact the attacker was Muslim uh, or that she was a convert from Islam or any of those things. They didn't report the fact that she was quite likely to have been attacked because she was criticizing Islam. Hartoon is a very brave and fiery um, young woman. I'm a huge admirer of her because she will go out there and she will confront the most radical extreme Muslims and she will talk about the problems of Muhammad. She will expose the, the critical questions around the Quran. She's not rude. She's not aggressive. She simply shines a very direct light on the questions around Islam's origins. And she. this is not the first time she's been attacked. And then equally here in the UK, you might say we've had things like, you know, the Batley uh, Grammar School, 
uh, a few months ago now. That was where there, there was that teacher in that school in the north of England who, in a class talking about religious freedom, happened to you know mention uh, and, and mention the the, the, the the cartoons of Muhammad that were done a few years ago and just showed one by means of illustration, not to poke fun, but to say this is what we're talking about. As a result, he received death threats mm-hmm. and has now had to go into hiding. And in fact, even just yesterday, I think it was, they day before we were recording this, uh, our old friend, the BBC, had a story about a horrific homophobic attack on a, on, on a couple of uh, gay men. I think it was in Manchester. Um, and the BBC totally managed to miss the fact that the, the folks who beat this gay couple up were a bunch of Muslim men. Um, and so I think the West, whether it's at the, the, the local level when things happen around Islam, from the geopolitical scene, just don't seem to know what to do. You know, you must never criticize Islam um, because it's a religion, you know, on the, on the other hand, um, therefore it means you avoid asking all those critical questions. And so mm-hmm. I think I, it bemuses me and it, and, it, and it depresses me actually at times, Michael, because it, it feels like we're, we're facing an ideological opponent, um, certainly in the form of radical Islam. And I always make a difference between Islam and Muslims. There are moderate mm. Muslims. There really is no moderate Islam. Um, and we're facing an ideology, um, whether it's the Taliban or whether it's extremist Islam here in the West. And unless we are willing to identify that ideology and explore it and understand it and then critique it and respond to it, we are absolutely we are absolutely doomed. At times it almost feels surreal. It feels like we, you know, imagine trying to fight World War II without you know being allowed to mention the nazis or <laughs> or talk about their ideology or sort of say well this is what hitler believes about our Ar- 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 and, and why it's wrong um it's almost as if like yeah that would be how we'd fight that battle and with radical islam mm-hmm. it's like well yeah we're fighting an ideological opponent um but you must never talk about name uh deconstruct or in any way criticize that, that ideology it's, it is frankly bonkers yeah and it's almost like you get Two kind of extreme views, don't you, in society? So on the one hand, you've got um, like a lot of the media basically trying to say, well, Islam's really peaceful. Like these people aren't really Muslims. Like if they were really Muslims, they'd look at all those lovely peaceful verses in the Quran and they wouldn't be doing these kind of things. Um, so that's kind of on the one hand. And then the other people on the other hand are saying, well, like that's clearly ridiculous. Like look at this horrific stuff that's been done in the name of Islam. Like, And therefore Muslims are awful. But then people, of course, react to that. And they're like, well, hang on a minute. I've got Muslim friends and they don't seem awful. They they love their family. They they mm-hmm. love me. So what you're trying to say is, I guess, there's a distinguishing between Islam as a system and Muslims as people. Um, obviously, not all Muslims are the Taliban. Uh, but you're saying there is, but, but whilst there are moderate Muslims, there isn't a moderate Islam. Unpack that a bit more. Yeah, there's so much that could be, be, be said here. But let me say, Let's say a couple of things. I mean, one of the first things I'd say, Michael, I think in, in the West, particularly, politicians, largely, and much of society, and certainly the media class, one of the problems is they, they don't know how to think theologically. As the West has become increasingly post-Christian, we've forgotten, as a nation, the importance of theology. You know, theology is, you know, okay, there are these strange religious people who, who believe things, but they don't really believe them. In fact, many Western politicians, I think, are frankly brought into what's affectionately termed the Marxist view of religion. But it's not about religion, it's all about economics. And look at how the West has behaved in the Middle East, largely. Well, if we just give them money uh, and mm. so on, so it'll be all right. And actually, it turns out that that doesn't work. And the other one we can mention, by the way, I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq, um, and uh, and Saudi Arabia. The other one you might mention, of course, would be the the so called Arab Spring. Do you remember a few years ago when democracy was supposed to be blooming across mm. the Muslim world, and that turned out to be a fairly short lived flower that kind of grew and wilted and and died. Um, and I think people have forgotten Western Western politicians have forgotten that for much of the Middle East, theology really matters. People really believe things. The Taliban, you know, are not just some bunch of wackos. They actually really believe something. In fact, I remember. I think it was after the Manchester uh, bombing, uh, you know, a few years ago, when the Guardian, um, you know, had a piece on 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 that. And of course, the Guardian is not known as a kind of bastion of kind of religious religious thinking. But the comment section was interesting because somebody had written under in the comment section on this article on the 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 the, the, the Ari, Ariana Grande Grande bombing, mm. and um, and someone had written in the comment section on that piece. Um, how I mean, how do you respond? Uh, to, to, to people who are so, you know, utterly nihilistic. And <laughs> under that comment, it was really interesting. Somebody had written, they, somebody had written in reply, no, I don't think they're nihilistic. I think the problem is us. 
we are the nihilists because we believe nothing. These people believe something with a passion. What they believe may be passionately wrong, but they have beliefs and we have nothing. And one of the problems here in the West is you think of the alternative that we're offering to people who are wedded to radical Islam. We're offering them, what, a diet of consumerism, MTV, and social media, and assuming that will give their lives meaning. And I think the only solution to radical Islam is radical Christianity. You need to replace one belief with another. And there are plenty of stories of, of radical Muslims who have become Christians. And that's ultimately, I think, the only way you can de-radicalize. So that's the first thing. And then the other thing I would say, I think, uh, quickly here, Michael, is that um, you know Christians are not immune from, from viewing things in a binary way. I get quite sad in that I come across, on the one hand, you know, Christians who sort of fear or hate all Muslims. I remember speaking at an event uh, some years ago where somebody, we were talking about something in the Middle East and someone in the audience raised their hand, this was a church event, and said, I don't understand why we're talking about loving our Muslim neighbours, we just need to bomb these guys back to the Stone Age. I mean, myself and, the fe- and a fellow speaker, it's been just being stunned of going, well, hang on, what happens to love your enemies, pray for yeah. those who persecute you, and reaching yeah. out even to your enemy with love and compassion, not, not being a doormat, but equally not just going, okay, we just use a military solution. On the other hand, I meet Christians who seem to think all we have to do is just hug and love and affirm. We must never say anything anything critical. We must paper over the um, over the differences. Our old friend Steve Chalk, who we mentioned on last last episode on When Christian Leaders Go Woke, you know, the other day tweeted mm-hmm. something about, you know, Muslims and Christians and Buddhists and Hindus. We all we all worship the one, the one God. I was like, well, that's lovely, Steve. But it, firstly, it's not true. And secondly, it's totally useless. And as Christians, we've got to find that that third way of blending together love and love and truth. You know, truth without love can just be very har- hurtful and harmful, and just seek to destroy. But love without truth just goes in circles and goes nowhere. We have got to begin being willing to ask the difficult questions: What is it about Islam? That's the thing we need to identify. What is it about Islam that is the problem? I think that's so helpful. It's, I wouldn't say it's even just you know kind of. Christians who have embraced kind of a liberal theology, like say Steve Chalk, but but actually even in kind of mainstream evangelicalism, there is, I think, a fear to criticize Islam or to criticize other uh, other worldviews and beliefs, which is interesting because biblically, if I'm going to be Aaron for a minute, can I be Aaron and kind of bring a theological perspective here? I feel like we we need one. Um, but actually, it is biblical, isn't it, to to challenge worldviews that set themselves up against Christ? I mean, that's what Paul did again and again um, in the New Testament, and. And yet we feel like, oh, we just we just present Jesus. And I've had that as an evangelist sometimes. You know, you shouldn't criticize other worldviews. Although it's interesting, we can criticize atheism as a worldview. It's totally fine to do that in a talk. But if you if you were to kind of like critique kind of Islamic worldview or another religion, it doesn't seem to be allowed. And yet, I guess in my experience, I would say one of the ways that we can really help people to see the beauty of Jesus is by putting that in contrast with um with Muhammad, with with the system of, of Islam. Um, and I guess for me, I haven't done a doctorate in studying Islam, uh, but but having studied it over the last few years, uh, it's given me a greater desire to want to communicate Jesus to people who are Muslim, because actually when I look at Jesus side by side with Muhammad, I just see how beautiful, how attractive he is in comparison. Um, so I think we shouldn't, we don't just be afraid of, of criticising. Um, uh, if we're doing it in a constructive way, so it's not just criticising, it's, it's trying to say, here's what's wrong, but also is what's beautiful about Christ. I think what's also interesting, you're talking about the word radical. Um, it's interesting, isn't it? Because um, there's a sense now which is all religion, all radical religion is wrong. So, yeah, the, the word radical is just seen as bad. Um, and actually, radical just means to go back to the root. Um, so the question is, like, you know, if you're going to be radical about something, um, you know, what are you, what are you being radical about? And I think the problem is, if you're going to be radical about Islam and go back to the root, which is Muhammad's, then you've got a real problem there um, when you actually look at his life, his, his teaching, his example. Yeah. Uh, but then you look at Christ and you think, here's someone who not only taught to love your enemies, do good to those who persecute you, but then literally does it uh, as he dies at the hands of his enemies. I think, well, well, do you want to be like a, a radical follower of the man who said love your enemies or just kind of like a half-hearted follower of the man who said love your enemies? I mean, like, so, so radical Christianity should be a really beautiful thing if it's radical to the root that's Christ, right? I think you're right, and, and it's interesting that the word, you know, obviously the word radical and the word fundamentalist are often thrown around in, with sort of scare quotes uh, around them. And I think you're you're right. If anyone ever says that to you as a Christian, 
uh, you know, if for folks listening to this, it's always interesting yeah, to turn it around with a twinkle in your eye and do exactly that, and so as you've done, and say, well, you know, surely the question is what you're radical or fundamentalist about, human rights, right? I mean, if you're a fundamentalist about the idea that everyone has inherent value and dignity, it's a good thing, presumably, you know, love my, the love that I have for my wife and my children, that's fundamental. Nothing is going to, is going to shake that. Pe- uh, presumably, people go, well, that's a good thing. That's an absolutely a good thing. So, you know, really all the word fundamentalist means, I think, is this person believes something more strongly than I do. And I think here in the West, actually, in this post-Christian age we live in, I think we're just generally afraid. Oh, well, that's funny, isn't it? On the one hand, we're, we are afraid of people who believe anything with with strength and vigor on the other hand we're just replacing one set of beliefs with another we've talked about this on previous podcasts so if somebody sort of made disapproving noises about fundamentalism and i bet if you would turn around to them and say oh so you you know you would you would agree that you know lgbt rights are basically negotiable they're up for debate i suspect the secular person you're talking to go well no absolutely not ah so you're fundamental uh, yeah. about them or you're you're a fundamentalist yeah. when it comes to your belief you know your, your your beliefs about climate change or transgender or whatever it is um so i think the, my concern is the west is in tied itself in knots and in all kinds of things but to bring it back to jesus yeah. i think you're absolutely you're absolutely right the contrast there is staggering and of course this is the key issue you know the really issue with islam is not individual muslims i would say the issue isn't even the quran when you read the quran michael there are radical verses there are peaceful verses but they're all kind of jumbled up together yeah. what mainstream islam has done for for for, 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 for over 1400 years uh, 1400 years roughly now has been that whenever you have two verses or two themes in the Quran, mm. passages in the Quran that, that appear to contradict, you know, peace versus violence, what uh, an Orthodox Muslim has done is say, well, okay, let's look at the, the the Islamic traditions that tell us what Muhammad, their 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 founder, was doing when those verses were were revealed uh, to him. Now, of course, as a Christian, I I don't believe the Quran was revealed to Muhammad, but we're just sticking with Islamic theology for now. Mm. And what they would do is they would use that, that the Muhammad's biography to give you a chronology of the Quran. And they would say, well, the, the later verses, if they contradict an earlier verse, those later verses supersede yeah. what's what's come earlier. Progressive revelation, it's called. <laughs> That's an older <laughs> sense of the word progressive. Um, and the problem you have when you look at Muhammad's career, Muhammad moved from peace uh, and tolerance in the early part of his career when the Muslim community was small to using violence and force and, and jihad and war and conquest when he got his hands on power. In fact, Muhammad fought something like 20 uh, military campaigns during the latter part of his life. And then, I would say to Muslims, uh, when I'm de- de- dialogue, debating this with them, then when Muhammad dies in 632 AD, look what the, the caliphs the, who ruled Islam in the golden age of Islam, those men who had lived and worked with Muhammad, who knew what he wanted, what did they do? Did they start a commune? Did they? No, they didn't. They went out and started a program of conquest that saw Islam within 100 years or, or so grow to become one of the world's great empires. And, you know, the British, we always get it in the neck for uh, our, our imperial periods. And, you know, that's a whole subject for debate. Uh, we had an empire. But Islam had an empire as, as well, all built upon what Muhammad did. And so Muhammad is the elephant in the room. So for Christians... That's why it's, I think, great to bring it back to Jesus and go, let's not debate the Bible and the Quran. Let's not sort of talk about, you know, geopolitics. Let's just say, well, let's look at Muhammad and let's look mm. at Jesus. And as you say, in Jesus, you have one to whom violence was done. Jesus, who's, Jesus, whose last words as he lay there dying on the cross was, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Muhammad's last dying recorded words were to curse his enemies, banish Jews and Christians from uh, the land of Arabia and just, uh, you know, criticize and curse people left, right, and center. He died with vitriol on his lips. Jesus died with forgiveness. Mm. And mm. a dear friend of mine who I lost a few years ago to cancer, Nabil Qureshi, and if listeners have never read Nabil's story, Seeking Allah, mm. Finding Jesus, amazing story of a Muslim finding Christ, Nabil wrote another little book, and we'll put a link in this to the show notes, called Answering Jihad. And he talks about how part of his journey from Christianity to Islam, Michael, is that as is that, is, is he began looking at the sources, he hadn't really looked at the sources, he just believed what he was told about Islam growing up, that it was peace of all and so on. And he finally got to the stage where he began looking at the origins. And he said, as he read Islam's origins and read the biography of Muhammad, he said he was forced to one of three conclusions. He either had to become a radical like the Taliban and ISIS and just go and start fighting infidels. That would have been uh, consistent. Or he had to sort of somehow completely explain everything away and come up with some very sort of uh, you know, sort of metaphorical interpretation of Islam that somehow sort of swept all those things under the carpet. But he said, I would always know they were there 
and they would never really sort of give me peace. Or I had to throw the whole thing out and mm. say, you know, that is it. Um, mm. And so Muhammad's character was a massive part of the of the journey for my friend Nabil from Islam to Christianity. I think one aspect of that's really important to remember is, you know, that wasn't him looking at kind of other sources outside of Islamic traditions. It, it was very much him going back to trusted Islamic sources to discover that information. It's interesting, like by way of comparison, so often when Christianity is criticized, it's like, oh, let's dig up this Gnostic gospel that was written a couple of hundred years after Jesus. Like this says something else about Jesus. Uh, we're not doing that with the Quran. It's not like we're taking some kind of like, you know, um, heretical kind of source that was outside of Islamic tradition. You know, like in, in a sense, one of the great things that can happen when you engage with a Muslim about Jesus is like with Nabil, actually they go back and they start reading, maybe because they've never done it, um, about the life of Muhammad, go into the original sources themselves and just, just put it right side by side with the Bible and, and compare. Um, so in a sense, one of the mistakes we make in the West is we just don't understand Islam as a system. We we want to kind of superimpose that either just it's not really important. It's just like Christianity is to lots of people in the West, a kind of nominal thing. And actually, for a lot of people, it really is important. It really is something that fundamentally shapes not only their personal lives, but the way they feel that the whole state should be run. And then I guess the other problem is in the West, we don't understand our own culture which is we kind of assume that we've come to democracy and the situation that we're in right now in a vacuum and that Christianity had nothing to do with that. <laughs> so we're basically like, you know, Christian, oh yeah, we might be a Christian country kind of, but like that's nothing to do with like how our country is run, how democracy has come to us. Whereas actually, you know, don't just read Christians on it, read some like Tom Holland and other secular historians. They'd be quite keen to say the kind of, way that we are today is very much fundamentally because of the influence of Christianity upon our history. Um, and yet what we're trying to do is take the fruit of several hundred years of Christian influence upon the West and then superimpose the fruit upon another country without any reference to where that might have come from, at the same time forgetting that they've come from a completely different start point in terms of their own worldview and belief system. And then wondering why it doesn't really work. <laughs> it's a, yeah, I guess it's a bit like trying to take a branch off, you know, an apple tree and just like graft it onto another tree and wonder why it you know, falls off. Yeah. Um, then we're starting from to to total different roots. I agree. And the funny thing is, what I find, I'm not sure that it's funny or tragic mm. or just deeply ironic, is that, you know, you look at some of the terminology that's thrown around um, by those who, you know, like to trumpet their progressive credentials. A cultural imperialism is a big thing, right? Mm. Cultural imperialism mm. is a bad, bad thing mm. in our culture. Most people do not want to be labelled cultural imperialist. It's not going to go on your resume. But we will, we will quite happily engage in cultural imperialism when we assume that things like human rights and so forth are, are universal. Mm. And it's interesting that you know, a country like, say, China – has become increasingly vocal on pushing back on that and saying, how, you know, how, who do you Westerners think you are telling us how we're going to behave? And I think the Muslim world is largely the same. It's often missed, in fact, that when the Universal Declaration of Human Rights came out in December 1948, it wasn't long after that the Muslim countries began protesting because they didn't like what that document said about particularly women's rights and the right of things like conversion and freedom of religion. And then the Muslim, uh, the, uh, a lot of Muslim countries came together and brought out their own version there is the islamic declaration of human rights which follows the universal declaration quite closely but makes some key changes and one of those is around is around women another one is around sharia law making it clear that islamic law trumps everything else mm. and the other is around freedom of religion and uh you know it's interesting that the, the bbc recently had a had a piece on on sharia law because of course everyone's talking about this and as usual got slightly sugar-coated uh, but totally missed the fact that in all four schools all the four major schools of Islamic law, conversion from Islam to another faith or abandonment of Islam to become an atheist is completely uh, forbidden. It's punishable by, um, by death. But yeah, I think we just, we just misunderstand. We, we misunderstand, I think, two things in the West, to just pick up on something you said and then throw it back your way, Michael, see what you think of this. That, you know, I find it fascinating. We, we misunderstand politics completely in two different directions. As you say, we misunderstand the Christian roots of, of, of political life here in the West. I think we forget where ideas like the you know, inalienable uh, dignity and value of every human being, you know, freedom of expression and thought and, and, and belief 
uh, commitment to free speech, to be able to say what you think, to speak truth to power. Those ideas do not come from a vacuum. They are deeply Christian ideas. And ironically, the, the prophets who are now pointing to that are all secular ones. Mm. You know, we've talked before on the show, Douglas Murray, Niall Ferguson, Tom Holland, even, uh, atheists like Luke Ferry, very well-regarded French atheist, uh, who, you know, despite them not liking organized religion, is very willing to talk about the fact that, you know, we here enjoy the fruits of, of Jewish and Christian uh, thinking and theology. So we misunderstand that. And the other way, we misunderstand, we misunderstand Islam. And particularly, we misunderstand that Islam has never separated religion and politics. That's the other great thing that I think Westerners get radically wrong about Islam. We're very good at compartmentalizing. Many Christians are as, as well. We put our politics here and our theology here. I don't know why I'm doing hand illustrations. <laughs> we're not recording the video, but I'm doing this. I'm nicely illustrating it on the screen. For those of you watching, uh, just listening to the audio, you're, you're missing this, but you can close your eyes unless you're driving and imagine this. Um, but in Islam, they're all jumbled together. You know, Muhammad was a political leader. He was a, he was a tribal warlord and he claimed to be a prophet and a religious leader, and all those things get jumbled together. And as you read the Quran and you read early Islamic sources and texts and Sharia law and so forth, all these things are, are jumbled together. And that's why so much of what happens in the Islamic world and here at home happens, uh, because for Muslims who take their faith seriously, and that's the other big difference, you know, in terms of taking things seriously that I that I really came to appreciate through Nabil and talking with others, which is, look, Michael, if I meet a Muslim who is inclined towards violence. Um, I, I want to get them as far away from Muhammad as possible. I'm not going to go, given what I know. Hey, you're a violent Muslim. Let me, let me, let's take a look at the life of Muhammad. Let's get the earliest biographies out. Let's get Ibn Ishaq and all the others out. And we'll take a look at Muhammad because that will get the violence out of you. No, I want to get them as far away from Muhammad as I possibly can. On the other hand, if I meet a Christian who is inclined towards violence, if I meet a Christian who who is violent or unkind or behaving in, let's use the word extremist ways, I want to get them as close to Jesus as I can. I want to say, come up, sit down, come on, let's take a look at the Gospels. How can you behave this way when it's Jesus who said, love your enemies? How can you behave this way when you follow a, a Lord who was crucified? So the direction of travel is opposite. To, to, get more, to get Christians behaving more peaceably, we want to get them closer to Jesus. To get Muslims behaving peaceably, we need to get them as far from Muhammad mm -hmm. as possible. And that antithetical direction of travel, I think, to me, says it all. Mm. That's fascinating. As you, as you were saying that, I was just thinking, it's a fascinating thought that, um, just back on what you were saying about um, the separation of, of religion and politics, and in a sense, one of the fruits of Christianity is that we've been unable to separate those two things out in Western culture. We can see that there's a difference between those two things. And yet, when you lose the Christianity altogether, um, invariably, it's impossible to then separate the ideology from the politics. Um, and we can see that, obviously, in is the Islamic world, where those two things are very much entwined. But even in the West, actually, so secular ideologies then become very entwined, and we're kind of blind to them. Um, and yet we then see them entwined. So, so the fruit of Christianity is that we can disengage politics and religion. And yet when we then get rid of Christianity altogether, we suddenly realize that the politics then just get entwined with another ideology. Or, or, or another I, think you're, I think you're dead right. And I think, there's a, I think it's interesting. I think the West is learning a couple of things, actually. Um, so I think we're learning, well, maybe it's the same lesson from different directions, which is that you can't get rid of theology. Um, so, you know, I often would say this to, to secular, to, to friends, and, you know, you get sort of, the responses are interesting, where I'll sort of say, you know, at the end of the day, we are wired to be theological. And when we're, if, if it's not Christianity, if you chase Christianity out and, and, and don't let Jesus in the front door, then through the side door or the back door, Islam is going to come. Mm -hmm. And Islam is a very confident ideology. And you, you look at the, the trends here in the West with, with immigration and other kind of patterns. It, you know, Islam is rapidly on the growth here. These issues are only going to get bigger. Or you get, you know, political ideas that become theological. So you look at transgender or those things which function like a new religion. And it was the famous, you know, Christian essayist and, and writer G.K. Chesterton, you know, over 100 years ago, who, who I think famously said words, the effect of, you know, when, when, when people stop believing in God, they don't believe in, they don't believe in nothing. They mm -hmm. believe in, in anything. Um, yeah. and other stuff gets sucked into the va vacuum. And then yeah, another writer whose name I know, do forget who said this one, you know, when you, when you chase God out the front door, the gods come marching in the back door. And, <laughs> uh, and I think we haven't fully appreciated that lesson here in the West. Mm. I think you're absolutely, you're absolutely right that, that because Christianity, when taken seriously, I mean, Christians have made a mess of history when they've forgotten the roots of the gospel. When you take Jesus 
seriously and you take the gospel kind of seriously. It does have political ramifications. I think, you know, I know if I think if Aaron was here, I know he gets nervous sometimes about, you know, pushing too hard on the, well, Christianity is, you know, has no political, nothing political to say. Mm. I think Christianity does have stuff political to say, mm. but politics doesn't become your identity. So it enables mm. you to listen when you take it seriously to those who, who, dis, who disagree. Most of these other ideologies, I guess, because they're not ultimately true, have to sort of take a, we conquer all, all who come. Uh, approach and that's islam and it's interesting that people people often say you know islam is religion of peace and i mm. often like to respond to that by saying well you can use the word peace differently right as the peace of jesus which is when actually you have broken down the barriers between men and women and you can bring people from all backgrounds together and that's what happens when people are in christ whether you're male or female you know whatever your nationality or gender or sexuality when you're united in christ that brings peace that's one way of doing it in other ways, the way the Romans did it, the Pax Romana, the Romans liked to talk about peace of Rome. That didn't mean Rome, Rome was peaceful and cuddly. It simply meant they had conquered all anybody who could stand against them, and there was peace. And that's the peace of Islam. That's the peace that the Quran envisaged, uh, envisages. That's the peace that Muhammad um, envisaged, that when, he has, when, when all have been conquered and either submitted to Islam or have sort of, you know, uh, sort of given way and said, okay, we won't, we won't ask any questions, then you have peace. And I think, again, it's crucial that as Christians, we are wise about these things, we speak truthfully about these things, but we always point back to, to Christ. Mm. It's not that as Christians, we are somehow better people. Heaven forbid that should be what we're heard to be saying. But we do mm. believe that Jesus is the only one who can bring peace. Um, mm. And ultimately, uh, I think until the West, and I pray that the West rediscovers those, those Christian roots and rapidly, because otherwise the future is just going to look more and more complex and difficult. Mm. Yeah, and I know we're rapidly running out of time, but just on that, I think, I guess one of the dangers would be to think, well, um, okay, so we can't just impose Western democracy upon Afghanistan, upon Iraq. We need Christianity. Okay, so we'll just impose Christianity on it. And of course, that goes back to something that has been tried. But of course, the reality of Christianity is it's not something you can be imposed upon because of the very nature of it, fundamentally. If it's about a freely chosen relationship with a God who loves us, it's not something you can force people into um, or just put upon people, um, if that's to be genuine. Uh, but at the same time, I think what we do want to say is that what Afghanistan needs, what Iraq needs, what our world needs, what Britain needs, is Jesus. Um, uh, and that's not something that can be imposed upon them politically uh, by another regime, but it is something that can be discovered. And and I guess one thing that's been on my heart over the last few days is you know, there are Christian believers in Afghanistan. Um, many of them now face massive, massive um, threats because of their Christian faith and if they don't flee the country um, and if they stay faithful to Christ I guess the reality is that many of them will probably die um, and yet the history of the church says that that actually the way of the cross is that as people not just live for Christ but also willing to die for him not kill for him but die for him um, that is one of the massive ways that often the gospel grows and I guess my prayer is that in places like Afghanistan and Iraq that there will be Christians who will be faithful to Jesus and in the increasing darkness of, of a country now ruled again by the Taliban, that people would see the light of Christ, um, not in the kind of power of this world, military might, um, but the power of the cross, which is a power that's, that's a power of weakness. Um, and that really can transform nations. And I don't know, I, I don't know about you, like, on the one hand, I kind of sometimes feel utterly depressed because I look at it and I think, gosh, like, it just seemed, you know, the power of Islam over so many nations just seems to be so great. And yet I look at what's happening in Iran and I think about the, there's so many people who are coming believers in Christ, partly because they've seen the darkness of, of Islam and where it can take a country and have reacted to that as they've seen the beauty of Christ. And I just wonder, will we live to see something similar happening? I do pray that we will in places like Afghanistan and Iraq. Yeah. And I guess kind of, kind of final thought as we're, 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 I know we're rapidly out of time, but I think you're, I think you're right, Michael, for Christians, I think, mm. I think, yeah, I don't, I don't think we have the, I don't think we have the option of just, uh, you know, descending into hatred. That's not Christianity. Mm. That's not Christ- That's not. That's not the gospel of Jesus. Mm. Nor despair. We should be mm. people of people of hope. And one of the things I'm impressed about when you look at Christians mm. in places like, um, you know, Afghanistan or China or North Korea, I have always been so impressed by the the joy and the mm. positivity that, that that comes out here in the West. You know, the slightest little thing happens to make our life inconvenient as Christians, and we can often become quite woeful. But those Christians living in places where life really is difficult, the joy that often comes out, yeah. because I think you learn very quickly. 
as a member of one of those persecuted Christian mm-hmm. communities where your where your where your roots really are that they're in Christ or in they're in Christ or, or nothing. Um, quite mm-hmm. frankly, so I think how do we respond as Christians? Perhaps to end there is a great place. I think mm-hmm. be praying for and supporting mm-hmm. our Christian brothers and sisters. Uh, in those persecuted countries go to go to a website and we'll put links in the show notes open doors is an amazing organization barnabas fund is another working with mm. with christians in those in those countries get behind them be praying for them so support them um mm. also learn from them you know as western christians we can too often fall into the oh yes we've got it absolutely sorted we're amazing and our poor brothers and sisters in the muslim world let's throw them a few dollars actually i think how can we learn from them how can we learn how to be faithful and to preach the gospel from the margins? We're used to in the West, perhaps preaching from the center of power when people used to listen to us because we were Christians. That era is gone. But I think from our friends who are in those churches where it's hard to be a Christian, we can learn a lot about what evangelism from below or from the side looks like. Thirdly, we can pray um, because, you know, we believe in a God who's on the throne and empires come and empires go. And, you know, Christians, imagine Christians living under those first 300 years of the Roman Empire. They must have thought, man, we're toast. I mean, we're this tiny nut group. Rome is so massive and so big, it can never change. Well, of course, we look back through history and we see what did happen. Empires come and empires go. That holds true of Islam, also holds true of the West. Uh, and mm-hmm. I think as Christians, we must not place our hope in, in, in Western politics either, because it may be God's plan that, you know, 100 years looking back, people who are right, right, looking back going, man, the Western civilization was amazing, but now it's something else. And Christians, I think the, European Christians get this a bit stronger sometimes than American Christians. So my American friends, I think sometimes are more tempted to blend together civilization and Christianity of going, look, Jesus transcends politics. So let's make sure that our hope and our faith is in Christ. And then lastly, Lastly, Michael, I know you're you're second this because, like me, you're an evangelist. You know these these theologians can spend ages debating how many how many angels can dance on the head of a of a pin, but you know we like to be practical people. Um, <laughs> Aaron's going to kill us when he hears this. This is great. Um, can I do Aaron's voice coming in right now? I can hear it coming in my ear. I can just hear it coming. But he's also okay. Unless you are in, unless you're a Christian who is a political leader in the military or maybe a journalist. You can't really shape these great currents and trends of politics. You can watch and you can pray and be faithful where you are. But you can reach out to the Muslims in your mm. in your midst. So if you have Muslim neighbours, if you're a student and you've got Muslim students at school, university, if you're, a, if you're at work with Muslim colleagues, reach out to them. Go that extra mile. Even if you fear Islam and, and really struggle with it, don't stop there. Reach out the hand of friendship. Build those relationships and then bring Christ into those conversations. Muslims are some of the easiest people to talk about mm-hmm. faith with. With our atheist friends, we're starting from square zero. With Muslims, we're much further on. Yes, they believe vastly different things about uh, about them than what we believe. And if you want to dig into that, read my book, The Muslims and Christians Worship the Same God. <laughs> Another quick plug. But to go, I think there's a, God is doing a great work among Muslims. We see that with the Iranian church, see that across the Muslim world. I also think things are beginning here in the West. And so we need mm-hmm. Christian men and women uh, to be reaching out with love of Christ to the Muslims around them, particularly those who've come here as refugees. You know, we're going to see more Afghanistan refugees coming to the West because of what's happened. What an opportunity, no matter what you think about migration or those other big political issues, what a huge opportunity for Christians and churches to welcome mm. them and share the love of Christ with them. Welcome them to our land, yes, but introduce them to our Lord or so. Mm. Mm -hmm. fantastic great note to end on really practical really helpful um well i hope that you have found this episode helpful um and and actually encouraging because actually we have a wonderful message of hope um as christians we've got something to offer the world and uh that's not often talked about obviously in the media and as we've been watching the news maybe we've just been tempted to feel depressed but actually reminder that in christ we have someone who is vastly different to the ideologies and systems of our world and uh, someone who can transform lives and ultimately nations as well. Um, That's really encouraging. Um, So until next time, um, do give us a like, a subscribe, um, do follow us on Facebook, uh, uh, on Twitter. Um, You can interact with us there. Um, Do send us your feedback. We'd love to hear uh, what you think of all these things. Do send us your suggestions for future episodes. Uh, We've had a number of suggestions coming in that we've stuck. If we haven't done them yet, it's not because we've ignored them. It's just because we've got so many things uh, that people have suggested and we've talked about that we'd love to discuss um, that we may not have got to them yet. But uh, but we do appreciate your feedback. Um, And uh, if you want to support us, um, how do people support us, Andy? Well, if people want to support us, they can. uh, If you go to our SoundCloud kind of page, 
I'll uh, look in the show notes. You'll see a link to our Patreon uh, account for the show, and uh, people can ch- ch- get involved there, chip in a you know a pound or a dollar a month, as little as that more if if you like, and that all helps go towards the costs of the show, particularly on the production side. You know, doing podcasts is is not is not expensive these days, but it's not free. Uh, either and obviously Michael you and myself and Aaron uh, we're all doing this uh, because we love the thing uh, not because we expect to make a fortune off it so it would make a huge difference if just one or two of you who uh, like and follow this show and we know that many of you listen all the time do just then uh, would be willing to get behind it and also value prayers as well that we um we this 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 is heard by the people uh, for whom it's going to make a difference thank you and that is not going to andy's holiday aaron's holiday or my holiday um that has been paid for not out of part of the cast funds um because partly we wouldn't have had a very good holiday if we if we were doing that Bogdan regis, to travel lodge in Bogdan regis maybe or wild camping michael when you and i go wild camping we might just be able to afford a you know mars bar between us yeah brilliant great um so thank you for joining us um and until next time um we'll see you again <laughs>